So uh, while we're waiting for folks to join, um, I just want to introduce myself. Um, again, I'm David Allen. I'm a partner solution architect at Neo4j. Uh, most of my job day to day deals with working with the strategic partners of Neo4j. Um, that is usually the cloud platforms, but also some of our technology integration partners. Uh, but I also enjoy writing a lot of open source on the side, which is part of what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, my job is about half business and half technical. And uh, very happy to be here today. Um, hope you guys had a great time at the keynote. And now we're going to get into some deep monitoring stuff, some really nerdy, fun stuff about Neo4j. Uh, a couple of reminders before we get started. First of all, uh, the slides are available. The link is on your screen right now. We have also pasted the link into the chat on this session. Uh, the software that we're going to discuss is installable right now, so anything that you see done in this session is something that you can uh, play along with at home uh, during the session or afterwards. Um, also, if you have a question as we're going along, I have a moderator who's helping me out. We're going to get to Q&A at the end of the session. I would ask that you please ask the question in the Q&A section um, within the conference application, and we'll get to them at the end. So with that, we are one minute past our starting point. Uh, and let's go. So we're here today to talk about um, monitoring and how to look after uh, clusters and single instances of Neo4j. Monitoring is a pretty dense and complicated topic, but in general, what I want you to know about this is that database software overall, whether it's Neo4j or any other database, it's pretty complicated software with a lot of moving parts, and fundamentally what that software is doing is persisting your data and making sure that it's always available to you. Um, as such, it tends to have a lot of care and feeding involved with it relative to other types of software that you might encounter like stateless microservices. So before we get into how we're going to do this, I want to say that at the product layer, Neo4j exposes a couple of different options for how you can get data out of the product and monitor it from the outside. Those options are basically Graphite, Prometheus, JMX, and CSV files. I've put a link in here to where you can find in our operations manual how those different options work and how to configure them. But essentially, these are information streams that Neo4j produces at all times that you can pipe into any downstream tool uh, to do the care and feeding of a Neo4j cluster. What I want to show you today, though, to give you a tour of what some of the considerations around monitoring are, is a tool called Halen. And let's start by talking about why Halen in the first place. Well, we want to take all the different diagnostic information that Neo4j can emit and try to organize it into a series of visual charts to allow people to actually see in real time what's happening with the cluster. We want to provide them a way of diagnosing some of the most common configuration issues that you might run into, where a lot of times users would come to us and they would say, what I'm experiencing is poor performance or out-of-memory errors or whatever the case may be. A lot of that stuff, before you apply a workload to a cluster, can be detected. And so we want to provide some feedback to the user about how their system is, is configured and how we can improve that. We also want to improve user understanding of how the database works and what impacts uh, the loads and the configurations that you place on it. And so we're going to uh, go over a couple of ways that you can educate yourself about Neo4j and learn more about database internals. And finally, you know, I just did Halen because, like I said, I, I like to do open source just like many people at, at Neo4j, and I wanted to contribute a graph app back to uh, the Neo4j desktop community. So before we uh, get into a demonstration of Halen, um, I want to talk a little bit about how to install it and how to get started with it if you'd like to try what you're going to see here today. Okay, so if you have Neo4j Desktop installed, um, you can basically click on the four icon graph app panel on the left by the first red arrow. And at the very bottom, you're going to see a link that says discover more graph apps. You kind of have two options here. You can either take the URL at the very bottom of the page, plug that into the install graph app um, application uh, um, box, click install, and then you're up and running immediately. Or you can click on the discover more graph apps uh, link at the bottom, and you will be taken to the graph app install page. This is a separate web page that lists all of the different graph apps that Neo4j has available. Halen is going to be listed as one of them up at the top, and right there there's going to be an install button. Now that install button interacts directly with your copy of Neo4j Desktop, 
and will allow you to basically open that link as Neo4j desktop, put Halen straight into uh, your system and allow you to use that with your current uh, project in Neo4j desktop. The second option, if you choose not to run it within desktop, or if you're, let's say, not on your machine where desktop is installed, is that you can run it online as a regular web application. And that's part of what we're going to be doing today. This is the URL where you can find that, and that's going to stay stable. So as new versions of Halen become available, you can run it straight off of halen.graphapp.io. So let's try to get into showing how this works, and that will allow us to explore a lot of different concepts about how Halen works. So here we have halen.graphapp.io, and I have a test cluster that I've created. And I'm just going to put in my username and password, encrypt the connection, and start up Halen. After initializing the connection, basically we get into um, this overall user interface. Uh, the overview panel gives you sort of like the single uh, overview of your entire cluster and what's going on. Each colored line represents one node in your cluster. And so we're looking at a four node Neo4j cluster. It happens that three are core nodes and one is a read replica. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. And the lines are color coded so you can tell which is which all of these displays have toggles. So for example, I can turn individual lines off and on as they accumulate data and scroll over. Uh, one of the things that Halens is gonna guarantee is that um, the black line is always your cluster leader. So you never have to wonder um, if you're looking for what the leader is doing, you can toggle off everything but the black line and you can see exactly what's going on. I want to go through a couple of things that it's showing here because this is a lot of these things are critical to your Neo4j system's health and performance. Um, the heap size that you specify is basically the working memory that Neo4j has for transactions that it runs. Um, if you don't have enough heap, then you can't run transactions that are very large. And so if you've ever run into an out of memory error in Neo4j, it's typically because you were trying to run a transaction that was bigger than the heap that you have available. And so by monitoring your heap size, you can sort of see how much load your server is in, is under, and how much memory it's utilizing. Now right now my cluster is like really calm, and so as we're talking, one of the things I'm going to do in the background is I'm going to kick off a sample benchmarking workload that I sometimes run. Um, and this is just going to basically hit my server with lots of different queries and you know, for our purposes today, it's going to make the lines jump around a little bit. And so you can see that as I'm starting to place my leader under load, the heap size is starting to jump around as it has to allocate and deallocate memory in order to handle that query workload. Um, physical memory is all about your total memory that's available or RAM. And uh, physical memory is broken down into a couple of different categories within Neo4j. You've got your heap, page cache, indexes, and various other things as well. Um, your last GC pause time is a measurement of how much time the database is taking up by reclaiming unused memory. And so one of the, um, the, the things that can hang you up with Neo4j performance is when your GC pause time gets very large. And so this is measured in milliseconds. And so we can see right now that, for example, our leader had a couple of maybe 16 millisecond GC pauses, but in, in, but in general, they're very low, and this is looking very healthy and happy in that um, garbage collection is not going to be causing this cluster an issue. Now, down here, we have one of the most important things about your overall system performance, which is page cache ratio. So the page cache is where you load data in from queries, um, and it stays in kind of like a hot set. So Cypher can give you really fast performance because it's answering straight out of RAM. OK, and so you want to see a usage ratio that's fairly high. And in particular, you want to see a high hit ratio. That is, when when Cypher queries are asking for data, you want to see that it's usually coming out of the page cache. If it's not usually coming out of the page cache, that means it's coming from disk and your performance is going to be slower. Another thing that I want to uh, draw your attention to is your faults per second on the page cache. OK, whenever the database needs something that it doesn't have in memory, that's what's called a page fault where it will go back to disk, fetch some data, load that into memory. And so if you see huge spikes in the page cache um, fault rates, 
um, that's going to be a very strong sign that something is misconfigured with your uh, memory configuration and that you're probably at the same time going to be seeing very slow query performance. Over here in transactions, this is just basically a view of how many transactions are open, committed, rolled back, or peak concurrent. And so we can basically look at the high watermark for each of our um, clusters, and we can see that right now uh, our, our leader hasn't handled more than 10 at a time, and max four hasn't handled more than, say, six at a time. So you can basically see what your workload distribution is if you're running an application against a cluster. And then finally, file descriptor shows how much, uh, how many open files are available on the system, and this ties to some operating system limits. Now, lastly, like if you're if you've forgotten any of that technical detail that I've given you, and a lot of people would, I want to remind you that you can take a look at this little eye icon, and you can generally click those wherever you want inside of Halen, and that's going to pop up a dialog explaining what it is that you're seeing and also providing you a link to further resources on the Neo4j website where you can get into things like how do I tune this to be different, what are the best practices, and so on. So this, this first screen is basically the overview that sort of at a glance can tell you something about the health of your cluster. The second is a list of breakdown of what's going on on each individual machine. And so we click when we click right this, we see cluster members, and then we see a display. I've got four here. The star always is referring to the leader of the cluster. Neo4j clusters are arranged into a leader-follower architecture, where the leader takes all of the writes, and the followers process generally read queries and also replicate your database to make sure that your data is always available. This little copy icon is a read replica, meaning that is the fourth node in our, in our cluster and it's available to scale out our reads horizontally. By hovering over this, we can sort of see that we've got this green signal bar, eight of eight fresh. Basically, we can get some data about how quickly this, uh, this uh, uh, cluster member is responding. Everything's green, everything's looking happy. So uh, really quickly, let's step through. You can see overall performance. This is CPU load on the machine, memory within that machine, the transactions that this particular machine is processing at the given moment, and how much data is on disk and how that is stored. Uh, so for example, I can see that my graph is about three gigabytes right now. In the queries tab, I can actually see what queries are actively running on this node at any given time and inspect those. I can even kill a transaction if it's becoming problematic. Um, further, like using the download button, I could, if, if I have a very high uh, concurrent transaction load, I can download that as CSV to analyze that later if you're, you know, if these numbers are flashing by too fast for you. Inside the configuration tab, I can take a look at how the entire system is configured, also downloadable as CSV, and I can key in and, for example, look for particular configuration settings that I may have set, and along with getting a description of what those are about, what they mean. In the operating system tab, I can look at, um, you know, this is, I'm running this on a Linux machine that has four cores uh, with no swap memory enabled, and I can see what the physical memory and file descriptors are on the underlying machine, as well as if I have the right APOC plugin installed, I can even see how much storage is available on the host. So for example, uh, where I am storing my data, um, I have 524 gigs of disk and it's 98% free. Uh, this means that I'm not at risk of about of, of just uh, running out of disk anytime soon. That's that's definitely a good thing. Um, in plugins, we can basically see what's available and you can very easily tell that I have APOC and graph algorithms installed because both of those are cool and I use them all the time. APOC is, of course, the standard library of procedures and functions for uh, Neo4j. And in fact, some features in Halen even require or recommend the use of APOC. So one of the really cool things that Halen will let you do is live sample uh, query collection. So um, what we can do is say, I'm looking at my leader right now. I want to say for 10,000 milliseconds, I want to collect every query that's running on the system. This is not doing this in Halen. It's just using a feature that's already built into the database. And then when the 10,000 uh, millisecond frame is elapsed, it will display what queries were running, how many times they ran, how long it took to compile them and execute them, and so on. Again, all that data is downloadable as CSV if you want to look at it another time. 
Um, finally, uh, with the right APOC configuration, you can even get access to some of your log files on disk. So for example, I can load the debug file, the debug.log file straight off of my node, and this will allow me to sometimes diagnose issues from the outside. All right, so far this is all happy and nice and wonderful, but what happens if something goes wrong? Um, I want to uh, next move to a section where we're going to break something and see what happens and whether or not we can see it going on using Halen. Um, the reason we want to do this is that a lot of bad things can happen when you're running a Neo4j cluster in production. Uh, a leader re-election, if one node gets um, weighed down too heavily, it can stop being the leader and another node in the cluster can assume the leader role. Uh, you can lose contact with the node because of a network issue. Um, you can have a restart or an out of memory error. So to, to show you what that's going to look like if you're monitoring a system with Halen, let's actually do it on purpose. So let's say that um, we want to kick over uh, our leader, which is max one. In the background here, I have um, a Google project where I'm actually running these uh, virtual machines that are backing the cluster. So I'm going to go over to max one, wait for my SSH here to connect. Live demos and their perils, people. All right, here we go. And so what I'm going to do is sudo systemctl restart neo4j. And basically, I'm going to kick over the database node on purpose, which is going to cause it to start and then restop and restart the software. But you know, in restarting that node, I'm going to have a period of unavailability where the, the rest of the cluster can't talk to that node and where it's unavailable for processing queries. So let's watch over here in Halen what happens when we restart the node. Uh-oh, it, it just went yellow, and then it went red. And you'll see that 0 of 10 is fresh, and basically our response times are starting to spike. Now, if the cluster just lost its leader, that's really bad for the cluster because it can no longer process writes. So fortunately, the cluster topology that's in Neo4j has already got that covered, and you'll see that max3 just popped up to a star. Uh, that's basically because Max2 and Max3 got together and they elected Max3 the new leader because you don't ever want to have a Neo4j cluster without a leader. Uh, that took like, what, a couple of seconds at most? Now, um, in the background here, uh, the software should have started um, sudo systemctl status Neo4j. And we should see that it's right now in the process of coming back up and discovering its buddies in the cluster. And when it does come back up, you should probably see the max one icon uh, go from red to green. And then it, Halen will gradually realize, oh, it's, uh, it's actually not a leader anymore. It's a follower. So we, we've now sort of simulated um, uh, a cluster topology event and rolling over uh, through that while monitoring it with Halen. Next thing I'd like to show you about that is that in the cluster diagnostic tools um, bar, you actually even get a cluster event log. So it will say, you know, if you're if you're not looking for that um, and you're looking at the cluster event log, it will tell you when it detects those kinds of changes um, happening. Uh, the next major thing I want to show you about Halen is the diagnostic feature. So when you get to this uh, wrench wrench icon here on the left in the cluster diagnostic tools. Um, there is an option to run diagnostics. And what that's really going to do is going to go through and systematically look at a lot of different elements of your Neo4j configuration, and then report back to you about what's good, what's bad, and what we might recommend doing differently. So uh, now, normally, this is entirely private, and Neo4j, or at least I, don't get any of this information. If you'd like to help us improve the product, you can click this button right here. And I, I want to tell you that if you do click this checkbox, then the diagnostic package will be submitted to one of the services so that, that I can actually see it, and we can tell what the common problems are, what versions people are running, those sorts of things. But that's strictly opt-in, and it's off by default. Let's go ahead and click Run Diagnostics. It generates a package and then gives you a set of advisor results. Um, so these advisor results are broken down by machine and are broken down by level So and also by category. So we can, for example, let's pick all of our warnings. OK, what's wrong with this cluster? Well, it's saying that on max one, page cache is not set 
so it can't evaluate the appropriateness of our memory settings for best performance set heap and page cache sizes. We also have no constraints defined in our graph model. And so if we would define those, it would generally speed up a lot of our cipher results. We can also go to, and let, let's say, look at the passes and all of the things that are right with this cluster to give you a sense of what this is looking at. So it takes a look at cluster TTL, your network port settings, uh, your users and role sets. It checks on whether or not you've got backups enabled, indexes in your database, and a host of other issues. We don't have to go through all of this. I just want to give you a sense of how much this is looking for. Um, finally, you can organize these all into categories, and one of my favorites is, for example, transactions. So when you, when you run a transaction on a Neo4j cluster, it has to get replicated to the other members in the cluster. And Halen will even let you see whether or not any of your members are falling behind. Uh, so for example, we can see here that our leader has this last transaction ID, and we can see that our other cluster members are even with that. That means that they are replicating fine and that all nodes in the cluster have the full data set, and that is what healthy looks like if you've got a Neo4j cluster. Uh, finally, when you've, got, uh, uh, when you've got this diagnostic package, we have already gathered configuration information about every single node in your cluster. So you can, for example, look at a difference. Now, one of the things that I personally find a little bit challenging about Neo4j clusters is that all three machines have to have their own separate configuration file. And then a common thing is what's different and did I mess it up here on node three, but, but node one is fine and so on and so forth. And so in the configuration difference tool, you can basically see that. And uh, you could, for example, filter out and then go all, only down to the options that are different. And so the advertised address of each node is different. That's good. They should be. They all have different addresses. Um, and their no and their their roles are a little bit different. We have three cores and one read replica, which is kind of what we would expect. So if I look at this configuration difference, I say, well, actually, all three nodes in my cluster are synced up and are looking good um, in in this way. Um, so here on this final page, um, you can basically get some cluster response statistics and uh, get a picture of how quickly your, your uh, cluster is responding to network traffic going back and forth. Um, a source of uh, slow query performance can be if your database is very far away in network terms. Um, if you have 400 millisecond latency there and back, then you can't expect a fast answer out of a remote Bolt, bolt client. Um, and then a number of detected settings, and this is where Halen is telling you what it knows about your system. Uh, Oh, uh, there's one other thing that I forgot, uh, which is uh, user and role management. Um, so using this kind of a tool, you can just basically get a graph, graphical way of um, adding users. So let's add one called nodes2019, and then type in a password for our user. Create that user. We'll add a role called nodes2019. All right, looking good. And let's then manage the user and pick uh, the nodes 2019 user and assign them the roles of nodes 2019 editor and architect. Click OK. Success assigning roles. Over here in the cluster diagnostics, we can actually see uh, that um, user and role changes have been made to our cluster. Um, you could, you know, you can actually even verify this a separate way. You could go into the leader here, uh, go into its logs, and look at its security logs, and you're probably going to see something similar. Yep, created user nodes 19, uh, and then added those roles to that user. And that user and role is now replicated all the way across the cluster. So any endpoint that a user has, it doesn't matter which node they're talking to or even the read replica, they're in and they are good to go. All right, let's see. Going back to, all right, how does all this magic work? Um, what I showed you was this UI that just kind of shows you this good stuff. Um, behind the scenes, what's happening is, you know, if you've worked with Neo4j, you probably know about Bolt. It's the binary protocol that we use to communicate with Neo4j. Just like a relational database might use JDBC, we use Bolt. Um, 
Now, uh, a lot of Java applications have a thing called JMX, which are the Java management extensions. They consist of a series of managed beans, and beans have methods that you can call. Now, Neo4j provides an interface to JMX. Uh, you can set it up remotely, or you can actually call Cypher procedures inside of Neo4j and get JMX data out of it that way. So just to give you a simple example in Cypher terms, if I ran this query, um, against Neo4j 3.5, I would be asking for um, Java platform level statistics about the operating system underneath. I could ask it for its system load or its process load and then return those just as regular variables. And that is effectively how, um, how Halen is working. Halen is a pure JavaScript Bolt client. And so when you're running it in your browser, you are a client of the database, just like any application that would use Bolt. And everything that Halen is doing is pure Cypher. Um, so there's no special access or anything different. If you have an administrative account, you could do everything that I'm doing in Halen with Cypher Shell. The only difference is that it wouldn't be graphical. So a couple of limitations of what Halen won't do. And um, it won't do real-time alerting or 24-7 monitoring or setting of trip thresholds. So this is a much larger topic. Today's talk, I wanted to introduce the ideas of you know, Prometheus, JMX monitoring, um, and how these metrics get sent from Neo4j and how you can visualize them and what they mean. Um, if you have bespoke needs, let's say that you're part of a big enterprise and you want to make it so whenever the page cache um, faults, exceed some certain threshold, somebody gets paged. Uh, Halen is not for that use case. Uh, for that, there are a bunch of other tools like Grafana, Stacked Driver, and Datadog. And so the problem then looks a little bit different. What, instead of visualizing what's going on with your cluster, uh, what you're doing is taking, let's say, Prometheus metrics, shipping them over to a service like Datadog, and then Datadog as a separate um, interface and application would allow you to set thresholds and reminders and so on and do things like automatically page your admin if the database is having trouble. So uh, not to say that Halen is the only game in town. It definitely is not. Um, there are some articles on Medium that I've linked, and so we've shared these slides. You'll have these links. Um, there is an option to build operational dashboards with a tool called Haudio. Um, there is a way of shipping monitoring metrics with Prometheus. That's what I was uh, referring to earlier, where essentially what you're doing is producing a feed of, of Prometheus metrics from Neo4j to some third-party tool. And there are a number of um, options for Grafana. So Grafana is a monitoring tool that takes graphite. And um, if you are an enterprise customer, I believe we have some internal dashboard code where we could help you with the pre-configured Grafana dashboard. Um, but there are a lot of other customers that are basically using these data feeds to build their own according to their own internal needs. And we think that that's also a great option. Um, so I now want to shift over to Q&A, and I'm going to start taking a look at Q&A, but I want to leave this slide up while we're talking through the questions. Uh, please remember to uh, participate in the Hunger Games. These are the questions that are coming out of the, the briefing session that we did, and uh, wish you good luck on those. Let's see what we've got in Q&A here. Uh, let's see. Um, can Halen be used to monitor... On prep, I think I think on prem is is men, me, meant there within a secure corporate network. The answer to that is yes, absolutely. So Halen is an open source app. There's a couple of different options. You can a compile it to a, stat a set of uh, static HTML and JavaScript files and then host it anywhere you like internally, um, or you can b use one of our ready-made Docker containers. Um, or you can see, use it as a graph app inside of Neo4j desktop uh, as long as you're within your corporate uh, network. So if you or your team is regularly using um, Halen, uh, one of the easiest ways to do it is to just host the, the build files on any website or server that you have inside your company. It will be inside your network. You can firewall off whatever you don't want um, and use it securely with a production cluster. Uh, Second question is, does Neo4j have a plugin for uh, Splunk? Um, no, it, uh, uh, oh, sorry, does, does, does Halen have a plugin for Splunk? Uh, no, it doesn't right now, but that is a really cool thing that I'd like to explore. Um, 
I'm gonna in a minute post the the URL to the GitHub for Halen um, into the chat. And uh, that's definitely something that I think would be interesting to see as an issue or in a future development release of Halen. And it's something that we could probably do. I would uh, really like to um, uh, work with people on what their needs are there and how we could get that done. I just put that in chat. Uh, so the third question is how to install it on a production server. I think I kind of covered this. Um, I, I, uh, what I can do is like really briefly display uh, uh, the, the short answer, you know, since we've got this up anyway. Um, so this is the Halen repository on GitHub. And there is, actually, I forgot that I did this, but there is a section in the main docs on how to deploy it on your own behind a company firewall. So if you don't want to use my hosted version, this is, this is open source. We, we want you to have a good time with it and deploy it and make it useful. Okay, back to the Hunger Games. I want to make sure that you guys can see these questions so you have a chance to remember to go to that site and log on and uh, uh, enter your answers to that. So uh, Rodrigo asks, um, the chart timeline seems to be two minute as a whole, meaning that you can only see the last two minutes. Um, it's actually about five minutes, Rodrigo. So there's a little bit of a balance here. Um, I think um, you can... It does support zooming in and zooming out to a certain degree. Um, and so if you can see me sort of doing that zooming in and zooming out right now, you can do that with your mouse wheel. Um, it does have about a five minute buffer. Now that's for two reasons. Um, uh, the first is that, you know, Halen isn't intended to be like a 24 hour a day monitoring solution. And then the second is that as you're gathering this data from Neo4j to, to, to hang on to it for let's say five hours, would be quite a lot of data. <laughs> and if I didn't limit this, um, what would end up happening is not you having this rich backlog, it would blow up your browser memory. Um, so as a result, um, there, there is this time gap and I can um, make this configurable for users if they want to know how to do that, but but it is, it is limited in time. Um, so the next question is, can Halen split read-only from the role management to support separations of duties. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, Eric. I'd like to answer that question. I'm going to take a stab at it, but if you'd like to clarify this, if I'm not getting your question, please follow up and ask another. Um, for separation of duties, like you can have an admin user with access to everything, or you can create a read-only user that doesn't have the ability to write or do anything um, on your cluster. It's fine to use a read-only user with Halen. Due to some internal Neo4j restrictions, there are some components of Halen that can't work if you're a read-only user because only admins are allowed to do certain things, but most of it still works with a read-only user. So um, uh, to get the most out of it, I sadly have to recommend that you use an admin user just because that's the way Neo4j works, um, but you absolutely can use a read-only user if you want to lock down how much Halen can have access to. Um, so, uh, the next question is from Rahul, who's asking, I think, I think a two part question. One is for real time recommendations and, um, the other is monitoring for long usage. Okay. So if you want to, again, if you want to monitor for long usage and let's say that you want to get a page, if, if your database goes down, this is where you want one of those, um, uh, monitoring or alerting tools like uh, one of the ones that I use sometimes is called Stackdriver. Uh, let's see if I can show you an example quickly. Over here on Google Cloud, they have a service. Uh, let's see. See if I can. I, I'm not sure if I can quickly find this. Uh, Stackdriver. There we go. Um, Stackdriver is basically kind of like a time series database and logging solution where you can send all of your logs and metrics to it. And then it basically soaks up this data. And so when you're talking about 24 seven monitoring, really you're gonna be throwing off huge amounts of monitoring data from Neo4j. And that basically goes into another database, whether it's Datadog or Stackdriver or something else. Uh, Stackdriver is the one that I use, but there are several good ones. Um, this is kind of a separate set of considerations. Like 
me being a Neo4j guy, I don't really recommend one over the other uh, because I think that they can all basically do the job. But this is where you would go to the Neo4j website, read up on um, Neo4j Prometheus um, and how to monitor Neo4j with Prometheus. Prometheus is just the way that you're going to ship the metrics from neo data into the evolving database of Stackdriver or Datadog or whatever you select, uh, the functions of that. Oh, okay. It says, uh, okay, screen sharing still up. Um, once you get that data over to um, Datadog, it's then going to allow you to define a dashboard with whatever kind of monitoring that, that you would like. Uh, Sankar asks if we can monitor CPU utilization, and uh, the answer is yes. Um, if you go to cluster members, let's just take a look at our leader right here, and this right here, system load, um, gives you uh, the load from the Neo4j process and the overall system load. Now, this isn't like an instantaneous CPU percentage measurement, but again, if you click on the little I, it will tell you exactly what system load is. It's a load average for the last minute. So if your CPU is under heavy strain, you're gonna see uh, the orange line there spiking. Uh, you know, I wonder if I could, I might actually be able to, uh, nah, well, my, if I if I had had something prepared, I could actually cause the CPU to spike, and then you'd actually be able to see it happen. But in essence, yes, you can monitor CPU utilization, and it's going to be basically the orange line under an individual cluster member. All right, um, I think that about covers the questions that we've got. Um, I'm. Um, Let's see, so Sankar asks, is there a way to control CPU utilization? Currently we are hitting 100% sometimes based on the number of Cypher queries that you're executing. Um, well, let's see, so uh, there is a way of controlling the number of concurrent queries that your database can run. Um, and uh, you can check the Neo4j configuration reference to see how you can do that. Um, Let's see, uh, from inside of the Neo4j product surface, you can't necessarily cap or limit how much CPU gets used. Uh, I think that I would try to control that first in terms of what my query workload was, uh, how much CPU I was giving to the system in the first place, and then also how many concurrent queries I was allowing to run on any given system. So when a person says that they're using too much CPU, it's a little tough to determine whether that is because the Cypher query plan is bad um, and they need to, um, let's take a look at a query plan. Um, let's see, so th this is an example of a particular query. Um, uh, let's see, this is uh, the, the okay, I'm sorry. Um, if you're looking at, let's say, this query view, and then you were to sort by the number of CPU milliseconds the queries were using, you would at least be in a position to know which ones were hogging all of the resources and where to focus your attention. Um, I, I think that probably the single best way of reducing CPU utilization is to take a hard look at the explain plan of your queries. And so if you've, if you've never tried that, uh, just write a Cypher query in browser and put as the first word explain, and then it will give you a query plan telling you how the database is doing what you're asking it to do and inefficiencies in that plan are usually going to be the culprit when you're using too much CPU. I hope that answers the question. And let's see if we've got anything in chat. Oh yeah, definitely thank you for all of these amazing questions. Um, going back to uh, the Hunger Games, I want to, before we uh, disconnect, I want to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to, uh, whoops, that's not the right one to um, answer these Hunger Games questions online. And at the very front, uh, remember that uh, the links to the slides for this talk are already in the chat and are gonna be available online. If you have any questions about any of this, please come to the community site and post a question. Uh, tag Halen in the question, and it might be that I'm the one who shows up and <laughs> post some sort of a reply, but we're certainly happy to hear from users, whether that's feature requests or even grumbling about something that ought to work differently. Um, I'm trying to make it better as time goes on and uh, 
community feedback is how I get that done. So thank you very much for taking your time and attention to be with me today. And um, I hope you guys are having a great Nodes conference. I hope you guys got a chance to sign up for Cloud and you were one of the 100 that got in because I'm telling you, I, I, have, all, I have this uh, in, inside the company knowledge. It's super cool. You're going to love it. And uh, thanks again.